I uh, don't have as long an introduction for our next speaker because I don't know him as well. In fact, I just met Jamie, what, two weeks ago for a coffee? Yeah. Um, but uh, this is not a speaker that needs a very long introduction, right? Because Jamie, I believe, is Australia's only employee of Kaggle. Is that, would that be correct, Jamie? Uh, one with you. But right. here, yeah. in Australia now. Oh, here in Australia now. So if Jamie's the, well, Kaggle, as many of you mm -hmm. know, is originally an Australian company. Anthony Bloom is originally from Sydney. Um, that's right, that's right, Australian all the way. So, Australian company all the way, but Jamie, being from Kaggle, and hopefully telling us about what they're doing and what they're going to do next, probably doesn't need that long an introduction, so please take it away, Jamie. Oh, okay, thanks very much. Um, oh, right. Uh, don't click this one as well. Oh, okay, cool. Um, right, well, uh, thanks, Eugene. Um, uh, thanks to Vodafone for hosting the, the get-together, and, and thanks very much to Eugene and, and Fabian and the other organizers for um, uh, having me along. Can you, can you all hear me all right? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, well, I'd like to give you an update on data science at Kaggle. Uh, specifically, what I'd like to talk about is, um, first of all, okay, excuse me. Uh, sorry, it's got a issue. Again. Great. Sorry about that. Um, specifically, what I'd like to talk about is, first of all, to pass on some of the insights that we've learned about data science in general from running hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of machine learning competitions over the years. Uh, secondly, I'll take a brief look at uh, some lessons that I learned personally from a uh, brief detour through in-house consulting on data science. Uh, and then I'll wrap up by giving you a preview of the data science products that we're working on now. Um, the prototypes are alive, and, and I'll try to give you a little uh, live demo. If you're not that familiar with Kaggle, first of all, a brief intro to who we are. What we do is, uh, primarily, we run data science competitions. So if you go to kaggle.com at any given time, typically you'll see half a dozen prize competitions uh, at the top of the front page there, all running. If you scroll further down, there are usually another half dozen research competitions, getting started things, public data sets. Um, so our clients <coughs> come to us with challenging problems that they'd like insights to, and we release those problems to our community of currently 390,000 odd data scientists across the world. The way that that works uh, is in just a sort of a, a stylized, simple example. Uh, in concrete terms, let's say, for example, that you're trying to predict the sale price of a home, given a few variables uh, about each individual home. What we do is uh, we split it into a training and a test set, very similar to the cross-validation style that, that Daniel was uh, describing earlier tonight. The, the difference with a, with a competition setup uh, is that we release all of this except for the target variable on the test set. We release all of that to our competitors. Um, so they <coughs> take that data set and do whatever they want with it. Uh, to fit any kind of model using any techniques. Uh, they make predictions for those missing values um, by submitting them to our website. We know what the actual values are for those hidden numbers so we can check how well they did. Uh, and when checking those numbers, we split them in turn uh, into two sets which we call the public leaderboard and the private leaderboard. So the error score on the public leaderboard gets shown to a participant straight away. Um, and so as soon as you submit a model, within a few seconds you can start to get bragging rights about how well it did and, and that sort of thing. The competitions run for typically a couple of months. Nobody sees the private leaderboard until the very end of the competition when everything's closed, at which point whoever is at the top of the private leaderboard wins the competition and the prize and, and the honor and glory. So that's how it works. We've done these a lot. Uh, and when you do it a lot, certain general patterns start to emerge, which are kind of useful, I think, for doing data science in general, um, outside of this somewhat artificial competition setting. Um, so I'll just take you through a few of those now. The first one is that just having a leaderboard itself uh, is kind of, a, it's a powerful mechanism um, to motivate people and to really get some, some interesting work happening. 
we really like using this leaderboard structure, first of all, because uh, it's objective and merit credit. So no matter how much hype there is about a particular technique, if it doesn't get you to the top of the leaderboard, then it's not useful. So it's nice to see all of that kind of stuff get boiled down to something objective. Secondly, <coughs> these leaderboards encourage uh, leapfrogging behavior, uh, known as the Roger Bannister effect. Um, as you may know, before Roger Bannister ran the four minute mile, many people believed it was physically impossible for the human body to run that fast. But in the 12 months after he did it, three other people did it, uh, and I believe beat his time. So there's something, knowing that it's possible to do that well, uh, there's something very psychologically powerful about, about that in terms of uh, encouraging your own performance. And finally, uh, this kind of structure encourages people to do many iterations uh, and to work very hard on these problems. Um, as you can see here, people submit literally hundreds of attempts trying out different ideas until they settle on the one that they like the best. As a result, typical competitions get results that look something like this. Uh, so on the x-axis here we have the weeks of uh, two months or so um, for how long this competition ran. And in the early weeks, you get some big insights and big improvements uh, on the leaderboard with the lead changing hand of, hands a few times. But this is where people have very clever insights into the data, some clever pieces of feature engineering to really like get stuck into it. Over the following weeks, you tend to get more and more incremental improvements. And so in these stages of the competition, people are kind of grinding out successive improvements, tuning hyperparameters, squeezing as much as they possibly can out of the data set that they've been given um, until finally the competition ends and usually by a tiny margin, somebody's declared the winner. So this pattern is very typical across uh, all of the competitions we run. We run. It's, it's very usual to see large, chunky insights um, happening kind of quite quickly after the data is released um, and then that kind of grinding phase towards the end. But on, on this projector and with these lights, you may not see, there are still some outliers um, where more complex, more difficult problems can take a while to crack uh, before they kind of end up at the top. So that's why we think competitions are great and, and you know, why they're a nice way to think about data science. Uh, they're not perfect though, and they do have some weak points uh, that we've kind of learnt and experienced over the years. Um, the first is that because of that grinding phase at the end of a typical competition, often the number one winner uh, is a massive ensemble, um, you know, a very complex model. Um, often that's exactly what the client is looking for, like just the most accurate model. But it's not unusual to see that clients, what they actually want is insight. Um, in a similar vein, there are no constraints over how competitors attack these problems. And with a two months time span, you could in theory spend two months uh, training a single model. And so actually putting this stuff into production may not match the constraints that the client happens to have. So for those two reasons, it's not unusual actually to see clients put into production the second or third uh, person on the leaderboard, who's also in the money, by the way. But, um, but for, for those reasons, because the, the simpler generalizable insights um, often end up coming, coming second or third. Um, some, some more, uh, some stuff which is more directly relevant to machine learning in general are the kind of gremlins that tend to crop up over and over again in these competitions. Um, and in fact, uh, our CTO, Ben Hamner, has a YouTube uh, clip, a conference talk just called Machine Learning Gremlins, which is really worth watching in its entirety if you have a chance. Um, but just the, the kind of headline results uh, are kind of interesting, I think. First of all, the, the main problem that we face, the one that we wrestle with every week and that haunts our nightmares is data leakage. So what we're talking about is particular parts of the data, particular features, containing information that let you learn things that you're not supposed to. Um, this is something that we wrestle with all the time. It's a very, very subtle problem to deal with and something that you face if you do data science on your own or, or in production or whatever. A favorite example of this comes from the early days of Kaggle. Coincidentally, um, it, it's, a, it's another prostate example like, uh, like Daniel was talking about. But, um, in, in this case, it was a competition for a health foundation to improve the accuracy of prostate cancer diagnosis like you know, out in the real world uh, by fitting machine learning models to a large data set <coughs> of demographic and health information about particular patients. You had to predict whether people were going to get prostate cancer. 
and uh, Anth, our founder, who was um, who was setting this up, uh, just before he launched, kind of as a last sanity check, he took all of these variables that the client had provided, dumped them into a random forest, and just kind of press play to see how it went. To his shock, it scored something like 96% accuracy on the private leaderboard, the, the holdout set. So I started to think, am I going to get a Nobel Prize in medicine? I mean, this is amazing. Like the, the accuracy of prostate cancer diagnosis from trained doctors is nowhere near that good, right? Then he looked a bit closer and realized that one of these dozens of variables uh, is, is this one called ProSurge. And in the data dictionary it explained, it's one if the patient had surgery for prostate cancer. <laughs> so, yeah, the, the Nobel Prize, not this time, but at least it was an interesting insight into, into data science and what can go wrong. So that's a, that's a classic example of data leakage. Um, our most embarrassing screw up along these lines uh, with a competition that actually launched was years ago uh, for a Wikipedia challenge. Wikipedia wanted people to predict uh, whether or not their editors would, as it's called, churn, that is, give up and do something else, or whether they would stick with Wikipedia and keep going. Um, this isn't strictly data leakage, but it's a related problem. Um, in the data set that they put together for us, churners and non-churners were you know, nicely mixed together, as you'd expect, but after the competition launched, it emerged that the churners were on the odd rows of the data set, and the non-churners were on the even rows. Uh, so the leading entry in the competition was perfect, I mean, can't fault that. Um, the competition itself was a debacle, it was a terrible learning experience, and so consequently we're, um, we've learned many more things since then. We bombard these data sets with, with checks, with, with every possible thing we can think of to try to detect this kind of data leakage. Um, still it bubbles up as a recurring problem, um, and it's something that, that uh, anybody who does data science has to face. I guess the general lesson is, to try to be paranoid about, excuse the white on the white on um, green there, to the lesson is to try as much as you can to be paranoid about the cross validations that you set up and the holdout tests, the, 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 the holdout sets that you use. If you want to know more about what that means in practice, um, uh, Campbell's blog this week has an interview with the chief scientist of Climate Corporation. Uh, he talks in, in some detail about how they do this at Climate Corp, and it, it's it's really worth reading. Um, uh, from our side, what we found is the most effective way to find out about data leakage or about any problems at all with the data set that you're looking at uh, is to release it as a public data mining competition and have thousands of people try to tell you where you screwed up. Um, so that's, that's from our point of view. The most common error we see from participants, from people actually competing, is overfitting. Um, so. Yeah, in this stylized example, it's the difference between the kind of crinkly green line that, that pays too much attention to the quirks in the training data and the, the black line, which is the actual good generalization. This is the thing we see people do over and over again. So the textbooks, uh, like Daniel showed earlier, um, will give you a graph like this with the training error going down and the cross-validated error, the, the out-of-sample error going up. The interesting twist on this from seeing it in competitions is that you can see, sorry, we can see both the public and the private leaderboard. We can see both the train set and the test set when the participants can't. If you plot one against the other for a typical competition, it, it usually looks something like this, where they're pretty well correlated across most of the leaderboard, except towards the top, which uh, on this lower is better graph, uh, the top of the leaderboard is down the bottom left there. Um, there, the public, score, excuse me, the public score and the private score are pretty much un uncorrelated. The reason for that is that getting that instant feedback with your position on the public leaderboard, it's a powerful motivator to the extent that people actually consciously or unconsciously try to maximize their position on the public leaderboard, forgetting about cross-validation and, and, and forgetting about this, this generalization problem. So what you can see is, is people doing things like this, where the, the private, the, like the actual generalization score just gets stuck after, a, you know, pretty quickly but they just keep grinding and grinding and grinding on the public leaderboard. Um, in most large competitions these days, it's not unusual to see somebody from the top 20 drop like 200 places uh, at the instant that the private leaderboard is, is, um, is revealed. So just a few words on what we've learned from all of these competitions, some, some common threads that suggest how to do well if you're interested in, um, uh, in these 
payroll competitions in particular. Um, one tip to pass on is uh, it's really important to have your local environment set up so that you can rapidly iterate. Uh, to have a, a data pipeline or, or anything that you, basically anything you feel comfortable with to, um, to basically go through this cycle rapidly and efficiently as, as possible. Looking at competition winners and Kaggle masters, though, the strongest common factor um, is the fact that they spend most of their time on feature preparation and feature engineering. Uh, typically, a competition winner ballpark would spend two thirds of their time uh, exploring the data, preparing the data, testing it, trying out features, looking for different representations of features, that sort of thing. Uh, two thirds of their time on that, and maybe one third training uh, and fitting models. So models are kind of like particular data, uh, excuse me, particular machine learning models are interesting and sexy and fun to think about and they're what you learn from textbooks and courses, but uh, in practice to, to win a competition, feature engineering is the key. That said though, the models are kind of interesting and, and sexy, so let's take a look at them. Um, this is a representative sample of competitions that we've run over the last year or so. Uh, and I've put together, I've tried to summarize the techniques that people used, um, the models that they used to get to the more <coughs> on the leaderboard. One pattern that, that leaps out at me is that um, apparently XGBoost uh, is uh, definitely king of the hill in the sense that it's the number one uh, flexible, off the shelf, generic machine learning package. Um, people use it all the time. It's, it's um, it's powerful, it's uh, flexible, it scales well. Um, a common question that we get is, uh, is it possible to do well in a Kaggle comp using off-the-shelf methods, or do you have to like invent your own algorithm or something? <coughs> so the answer is, is uh, definitely it is possible to do well. In fact, as you can see, it's possible to win a typical Kaggle comp uh, purely using stuff from you know public libraries, um, RMS and that sort of thing. Uh, so on top of XGBoost, one thing that also pops up a lot recently is Keras, uh, which is uh, one of several competing Python frameworks for, um, it's like a high level wrapper over CNNs for doing deep learning. <coughs> um, speaking of deep learning, one last uh, trend to mention is that um, uh, it's, it's really striking how different image recognition has become uh, in the last few years, and that's definitely a trend that we've seen at Kaggle. Uh, in that the winners of image recognition comps have totally different approaches from every other kind. So if I was giving this talk, you know, five years ago, um, it would be the same message for images as for everything else. Like, think carefully about, you know, cross-validation and, you know, be, be very parsimonious, be, be very careful with your models. But uh, now the main message from our image recognition comps uh, looks something more like this. <laughs> like, just add more layers to your CNN, to your deep learning. Then when you finish that, add more layers and then more and continue until you run out of AWS credits or your computer explodes or something. Like that trend clearly has a long, long way to go. Um, just there's, there's no limit. It's, nobody's hit the limit yet for how much complexity you can add. Oh, sorry, just one final note on, on these competitions. Um, uh, personally, I've been surprised at two things which haven't shown up um, in the top 10 recently. Two algorithms that I personally think are underrated, uh, Barita and the latter. Uh, they're both fairly recent, um, and I think my hunch is that the reason people aren't using them more is because of some implementation quirks. Um, so I definitely think they're worth a look if, if you're interested in this kind of thing. Uh, so that's, that's some data science lessons from uh, competitions and about competitions. Um, just briefly, I'd like to look at uh, some things that I learned as a data scientist from a brief detour into in-house consulting uh, with Kaggle. Um, two things really. The first is just, uh, it really brought home to me the value of data science pipelines. So this was something I'd heard of and I'd seen used by uh, like <coughs> big data folks and I thought that was strictly for them. But really having, um, what I'm talking about is just something like uh, using you know, Make or an equivalent tool um, so that when you make a small change at one point of your your um, production process, you don't have to rebuild the whole thing. Um, it's just, I, I do that now all the time for my like little side projects and stuff. It's just, it's really worth checking out if you have. And the second thing is um, what I call the power of easy visualization. 
because everybody knows you're meant to graph your data, right? The, everybody says graph your data. If I'm in a job interview, I say, oh yeah, but always graph your data, very important. But I don't graph my data. I mean, like, who's got time for that, right? And, you know, it's, it's a lot of hassle. Um, but on these consulting projects, uh, we hacked together some shiny apps to do data exploration just through point and click. And I thought that would be like a toy sideline to sort of impress the client with or something. And I was stunned by how much more productive it made me. Um, not having to deal with the friction of starting up R and then remembering ggplot syntax and that sort of thing. So I was absolutely thrilled to see Raptor released um, a few weeks ago. Uh, this is very similar to what we hacked together internally. Um, we won't release ours because it's too specific you know, to our little thing, but um, if you haven't seen it already, definitely check it out. And I would suggest use it on an actual problem, and my experience would be that you will be surprised by how much um, productivity you can get from something like this. So, Matt's nice to Eugene and his co authors. I, I'm really excited to do this. Um, so, that's, uh, that's it for data science lessons. Um, just a quick preview of, of what we're doing now, though, which is um, uh, after this sort of brief detour through, through in house consulting, um, what we realized is that. There's no place that we think of as like GitHub for data science. Um, that's where we're building towards. Uh, to be a place where data scientists can share work, can fork off each other's work, see what each other are doing, and built on top of uh, open source tools, principally Docker, but also you know, all the rest, um, actually execute uh, and reproduce the data science work that they're doing. So in practice, We've launched the prototype uh, live for people to play with on our current, most of our current competitions. Um, we're focusing so far on the Docker, um, the execution environment uh, part of this whole sort of concept. What that means is, um, if you haven't seen Docker, it's like a super lightweight VM. So usually with a virtual machine, you know, you have to start it and then go and get a coffee, you know, while it boots up and that sort of thing. Docker is so lightweight that it literally takes milliseconds to start up and, and, and tear down. So for data science in particular, it means you can have a snapshot of your data science environment set up exactly how you like it, with all of the libraries loaded perfectly, everything ready to go, and then with, a, with one single command, like run a regression on this new data that you've, that you've, come in, uh, that you've, <coughs> that you've got. So uh, I'll just quickly, let's hope this internet connection is working. Um, if you go to kaggle.com slash scripts right now, you'll see uh, a list of all of the scripts that uh, Kaggle, um, that, that Kaggle has made already on the, the competitions and public data sets that we've been hosting. Um, and if you go into any of them, uh, <coughs> excuse the slow connection there, um, that'll, um, if you click through any of them, you'll see the code that people are using, people are sharing visualization techniques, model fitting techniques, data exploration, um, very general things, very specific things. Um, and so in this case, this is a Python script um, showing how to do a sort of simple beat the benchmark thing on one of the current competitions. Uh, if you fork somebody else's script, then that takes you into an editor where you can then immediately start to execute this code and play around with it, um, actually executing live in Docker containers out in the cloud. So, uh, sorry my Connections a bit dodgy there, but um, please do jump right in and, and have a look at this. Um, have a play with it and, and tell us what you think. We've just launched, um, we've just included uh, IPython notebooks into the list of things that you can use these things on, as well as R, <coughs> Julia, SQLite. Um, so there's a fair few options to play with, and um, yeah, please uh, please have a look at it and, and see what you think. Um, that pretty much covers what I wanted to talk about. So um, thanks very much. Please check out kaggle.com slash scripts. And uh, yeah, see you around. And, and we might have time for questions. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Come on, folks. Let's have them over there, Patrick, folks. Right. Uh, yeah, thanks for that uh, uh, great presentation. Just, um, just something that uh, occurs to me sometimes when I'm having a look at Kaggle. Do you get sort of the opposite of what you've talked about there? Someone who's just submitted They've tried a, like a one-off model, and then they accidentally win the competition on the private leaderboard. Has that ever happened where people have jumped up the other way because somehow weirdly it's fitted to the, the privately held data and not the public data? Has, uh, has that a thing? Um, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, 
sorry. The restaurant competition. Oh, really? OK. Yeah. I missed that one. Yeah, I, I don't have a good example. But, um, is that Tattoo? Yeah, it jumped over, I think, 300 uh, spots. Oh, OK. That's pretty good. So there you go, tough Cool. Thanks. Uh, thanks. I've got um, two questions. With, uh, with Docker, which looks really interesting, um, what about the sort of models that, that uh, require, say, a fair bit of training time, say, the, the, um, the deep models, perhaps yeah. images or something like that? How, how are you going to handle that? So that's the first question. And given that, uh, going back to what you talked about earlier in the presentation, how um, people who people can seem to be able to make as many submissions as they want. So surely, if you're going to make 100 submissions or 1,000 submissions, your your chances of getting a good score on the private data set just by chance obviously go up. So so how do you deal with that issue? Sure. Um, thanks. Two good questions. Uh, on the training time issue, yes, um, a live demo uh, is limited to 20 minutes. So that's uh, what we found is for most competitions, that's enough time to fit a pretty decent model, say an XG boost. Um, but yeah, it's not enough time to run a deep learning, you know, the full catastrophe. Like those guys train for you know 24 hours for a single model run, right? Um, so currently we are because um, it's all free. It's limited to 20 minutes. Um, but you could definitely like pull a Docker image and run it yourself, uh, or on your own cloud instance or something, if, if you wanted. Um, this is all all of our Docker containers are open source, so um, you can pull them from Docker Hub or rebuild them yourself. Um, on the second question, uh, excellent point. Um, there are I, I didn't in my kind of brief overview I didn't include this detail, but uh, every competition has a maximum number of submissions per day uh, that every competitor has. So. Um, Typically, of the order of two to five, um, which is quite a constraint. So it's enough for you if you're really determined. You can like overfit enough that you and you know try to probe the private leaderboard, the public leaderboard, or whatever. Um, but yeah, really, it's not enough to, to do a complete kind of exploration. One thing, one, one kind of factor is that um, that daily limit rolls over at UTC time, like uh, and. Consequently, we see a massive spike in submissions at UTC like 0005, where um, people's daily limit resets, and suddenly they've been, they've been burning to try out their new ideas, and then our servers get swamped uh, every day. Mm -hmm. uh, Jamie, um, I have to play for a second the uh, devil's advocate. Um, I know that uh, Kegel has done a lot of great, th um, and great things for the community, but if one could also say, if you think about crowdsourcing, it's um, get labor, like a lot of labor for maybe a cheap price, right? Sure, like, sure. Um, I was wondering what do you guys do like when it comes to company, like negotiating in terms of what is the price or what do people get? Like how do you try to push it that people get as much as possible out of this, like mean the contributors? Sure, sure, thanks. Um, yeah, that, that's a good point. And it's, it's something, uh, the idea that we're making people work a lot for free, essentially, is something that strikes a lot of people when they first see Kaggle or first hear about the concept. And what I think you learn when you start competing and start taking part in this is that, um, uh, firstly, you get a lot out of Kaggle just by hanging around. Um, and so the Kaggle forums and now scripts, people share a lot of ideas. And you really you can develop very rapidly as a data scientist. Uh, without kind of the prize money even being relevant. Um, and the second thing is that uh, just your, in a way, the kind of um, you know, sort of people's labor versus compensation and stuff. Um, I, I guess the second point is that a lot of it is quite fun. It, you know, people do this kind of thing for fun. Um, but the third main point is that more than any particular prize money, just your Kaggle ranking and your position in the Kaggle community our experience has been that's much more valuable uh, like as a data scientist. Um, any particular cash prize for a particular competition, like all of the Kaggle masters and the people in our current top 100, they're sort of unhirable because they've already landed their dream job, um, many of them through climbing up the Kaggle leaderboard. Like um, some of our former number ones are people from like towns you've never heard of in, in places, you know, with no kind of formal background, but uh, it's kind of 
going back to the sort of objective and meritocratic uh, aspect of the leaderboard, um, there are a lot of avenues like that for people to kind of crack it into the big time. So that doesn't directly answer your question, but um, but that's kind of how, how I think about it. Last question. Yeah, okay, so quick question here. Sure. How, can you use a leaderboard or can you use historical pri uh, prizes to judge complexities of classes of problems? Like, have you got any insight as to how you can judge? Like, you're always given a problem and you're never quite sure how complex it is at the outset. Have you guys got any insight from your platform as to how to judge the complexity of a given problem? Um, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, I'll have to think about that some more. Nothing I can give you a nutshell answer to. Um, yeah. Uh, so I guess we tend to get problems of all different types. Uh, so we have like image recognition, MRIs, basic classification, CTR, click-through rates, um, you know, recommendations. Uh, it seems to us like a very broad array of problems. As to which is kind of more complex or more suited to comps, uh, I'm not sure off the top of my head, but, but it's a really good question. All right, can you all join me in thanking Jamie for a first talk? Okay, it won't take too long of your time, but 10th House, I head up the analytics team there, analytic recruitment team. A lot of you know me, I've been involved in coming along to data science for the last three years. I thought it was about time to put back. So I guess we are sponsoring, so hopefully the video over the next week or so will be up with tonight's presentations. And then further on, they'll all be up there to go and look at if you can't attend the, the evenings, which is, which is great. Also, hopefully, we'll have pizza next time. So we'll sort that out as well. But from my side, 10th House, we basically, on the analytics side, look after all analytics roles. We go across a range of different marketplaces, um, and BI, data science, uh, into the digital marketplace. Basically here to be of any help to the data science members. If anyone's got any questions around recruitment, it's always difficult, or if anyone's looking to hire people, I'm here to speak to. Thank you.